Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So in this video today we are going to be analysing one of the most popular power and conflict poems in the AQA GCSE power and conflict poetry anthology syllabus, which is John Agard's Checking Out Me History. This is probably one of the most highly requested poetry analysis videos, so let's dive straight into it, and I hope it helps you with your revision. So as always, a bit of biographical context before we dive into the poem proper. So John Agard was born in 1949 in British Guyana, and now known as Guyana in South America, in North and South America. So he moved to England when he was 28 in 1977, where he has lived ever since. And ever since he's been in Britain, he has worked tirelessly to promote public understanding of Caribbean culture, largely by traveling to schools all around the UK, and performing his poetry. He was appointed writer in residence at the London South Bank Centre in 1993, and he's also the winner of various literary awards, including the Paul Hamlin Award for Poetry in 1997, and the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry in 2012. He's also husband to fellow British Guyanese poet Grace Nichols, whose works also capture different aspects of Caribbean culture, history and language, often with uh, a more of a feministic bent. Her poetry is also incredibly vivid and interesting, so I would highly recommend that you take a look at her works as well. And so Agard's poetry is often marked by a sort of linguistic inventiveness. There's a sort of daring spunkiness to the way he writes, often including Caribbean Creole register and mixing that up with standard English. And so there's always an element of playful defiance that's very characteristic of his poems. He often invites readers to challenge this idea of cultural hegemony, especially a sort of Anglo-centric hegemony, and to view existing concepts from alternative and often marginalised perspectives. And so, of course, checking out me history is very much representative of this sort of purpose. So let's dive straight into close reading the poem. So the poem begins with a distinct Caribbean Creole register, as signified by the phonetically rendered third person pronoun dem here, and dem tell me, and of course dem here is the Creole version of them. Um, so immediately we see this juxtaposition between dem and me dem tell me. And this suggests a relationship of opposites, right? So who's the dem? And why would dem be telling me, the speaker in this case, anything? So this idea of being told something suggests that communication, and specifically the dissemination and the reception of information, are going to be key concerns as we go on to read the poem. So the poem begins with a heavy ampibrachic which is the unstressed stress, unstressed rhythm, but also a waltzy rhythm. And this gives the work a sort of melodic cadence, right? And because if you listen to it, it says, dem tell me, dem tell me, what dem want to tell me, right? So there's this waltzy, unstressed stress, unstressed kind of accent there. And so indeed, if we watch Agart's oral performances of this poem, and I'm gonna link a, a good example of that in the description box below, which is actually by BBC Teach, we're gonna see that the poet sings rather than reads his poem. And this invites us to consider the sort of porousness between two supposedly different mediums of song and poetry and of music and words. And so this leads us to think, well, if the lines between song and poetry are so close to one another, then are the boundaries between different narratives, the narrative of a Caribbean Creole poet versus the narrative of, say, British colonial curriculum, are these narratives just as fluid, making it possible for one party to reappropriate narratives according to their own agendas, right? So this, of course, brings us to one of the central preoccupations of the poem and the bigger preoccupations, which is how history, which is the seemingly singular monolithic concept, can in fact be represented in a multitude of forms and versions when seen from various perspectives. And this thesis is what we're going to go on to explore in the rest of our analysis. So the most prominent trope in this poem is, as I'm sure most of you will be aware, 
uh, and also largely what kind of contributes to, I guess, the difficulty of the work is illusion. So the thing is, a quick Google search is going to give you all the information you need about all the specific historical figures and events referenced in this poem. But what's most important is your interpretation of why these illusions are significant to the poem's central message and why perhaps they are arranged in the way that they are. So instead of going knee deep into the factual background of who the historical figures are and what the dates refer to, in this video I want us to consider a couple of guiding questions which are going to help us direct our focus towards analysing the poem instead of getting too caught up in the superficial facts. So here are the four questions that I want you to think about before we carry on watching this video and hearing out my analysis. So the first one, in stanza three, what is so ironic about the juxtaposition of 1066 and all that versus Toussaint Le Overture? And the second question, in stanza five, why does Agard anonymize the Anglo-centric historical heroes and achievements, specifically the man who discovered the balloon, the cow who jump over the moon, the dish run away with the spoon, but spells out the full name of the Jamaican war heroine, Nanny D. Maroon. The third question, in stanza seven, what is the significance of the poet, what is the significance of the poet alternating between allusions to historical characters from the colonial group of people, the Europeans, Lord Nelson and Waterloo, and Columbus and 1492, and the colonized group of people, Shaka de Great Zulu and de Caribs and de Arawaks. And the last question I want you to think about is, in stanza eight, why does Agard begin with a reference to Florence Nightingale and Sheila, but end with Mary Seacole? Both of these female figures sharing a similar background as English nurses who made landmark achievements in the Crimean War. So, before I share my view on these questions, I want you to pause this video and think about them yourself. And I'm just going to assume that you have already read through this poem as you revise. So once you've come up with your own ideas, you can come back to this video and compare your own notes with mine. Because ultimately, I don't want to be spoon feeding you my analysis for you to just regurgitate mindlessly. I want you to think about the poem yourself and engage with the ideas that I'm now putting forth, because these are ultimately just my ideas and my suggestions, which are here to inspire and aid you to come up with your own creative interpretation. So let's start with the first illusion in this poem, 1066 and all that. So this refers to the Norman Conquest, where the French Duke of Normandy, who was later called William the Conqueror, invades Anglo-Saxon territory and thereby changes the course of English history. Now, given the pervasive Norman influence on English culture, society and politics, this should be deemed important enough to be featured in the national curriculum, and no one's going to argue with that. So William the Conqueror's achievement is the story of a French victory. And yet the allusion to Le Overture, Toussaint Le Overture, presents the instance of a French defeat, as Le Overture had led the Haitian people to victory during the Haitian Revolution, which resulted in their independence from French colonial rule. And yet, the speaker implies, why was Le Overture's success never taught to him, despite it being arguably just as important a historical instance from the perspective of the colonised peoples? Now, interestingly, even such a flippant, apocryphal folktale like Dick Whittington and He Cat, which is the story of an Englishman who made his rags to riches fortune by selling his cat to a rat infested nation, is taught to children and given a place in textbooks, and yet not the valiant decolonization efforts of a Haitian war hero. So, what's the implication then? Well, is probably that a national curriculum that is designed by the colonizers is ultimately going to be skewed and biased because it's only going to seek to glorify and preserve the achievements of the Europeans, but leave out and erase from the mainstream narrative the achievements of those colonized and marginalized peoples. But it doesn't mean that those colonized and marginalized peoples don't have their own fair share of victories. Now, with the turn into the indented stance of four, we see the emergence of what we call the counterpoint structure, which splinters from the dominant voice 
into a secondary voice. So whereas the dominant voice is retrospective, assertive, and characteristic of an adult, the secondary voice in those indented stanzas sounds like that of a child who's just learning about and absorbing new information piecemeal. And so the register, as you can hear here, Toussaint, a slave, with vision, lick back, Napoleon, battalion, it's very choppy, right? So the register isn't so much Creole as it is rudimentary, almost like a child mimicking and repeating the words that he or she hears from the teacher. And the syntax, as we can see, is a lot more broken compared to the dominant stances. And so perhaps it's to mimic the way a child processes these various details about Toussaint's identity, background and achievements. So this shift in voice and perspective from this adult to a child could be read as the speaker's imagining of a re-education for his childhood self, reimagining that he is receiving a national curriculum which is much more inclusive, diverse, polyvocal, and much less hegemonic and anglocentric than the one he had once received. Note as well this allusion to Napoleon in line 14. So Napoleon is a classic symbol of European military heroism and is here mentioned as a point of comparison to Leoverture as the first black republic born beacon of the Haitian revolution. Right, so it's uh, juxtaposed against Toussaint these references to Toussaint. And so in Agat's version of the reimagined curriculum then, both Toussaint and Napoleon, the colonized and the colonial heroes, are given equal representation. Neither is emphasized at the expense of the other, unlike the more Anglo-centric national curriculum that he had once received. Now, as the narrative shifts back to the dominant voice in stanza five, two interesting observations come to light. First, by placing maroon as part of the end rhyme sequence with balloon, moon, and spoon, which are words that allude to the French inventor Shock Charles and the English nursery rhyme Hey Diddle Diddle, Agard suggests that the colonizers and the colonized aren't actually all that different. They're both part of the same sequence and they're both part of the same historical tradition because both sides experience victory and defeat at different points in history and so both sides have their own heroes and achievements to be proud of. So what this does is it symbolically equalizes the status of the colonizers and the colonized, which is, of course, conventionally viewed in hierarchical terms, with, of course, the colonizers being superior and the colonized inferior. But by anonymizing the Anglo-centric references and rendering them more generic with D-man, D-cow, who jump over the moon, and D-dish, run away with the spoon, Leaving the only concrete illusion to be Nanny D. Maroon in line 25, which was never told or taught to the speaker in his youth, what the poet does is he affects a subtle gesture of power reversal. Because these dominant European references, which have always been communicated to the children, are now stripped of their most basic identifier, which is their names. But the character who has always been underrepresented in the mainstream narrative, Nanny de Maroon, is here vindicated in Agat's poem by being given this pride of place in the narrative. And so Nanny of the Maroons was the leader of a group of enslaved Jamaicans who, like Leoverture, fought against colonial rule successfully and managed to gain independence for her native land. But her glaring exclusion from the national curriculum once again sheds light on the Eurocentric narrowness of a colonialized education. Now, stanza six may be short, but by crystallizing the Jamaican war heroine's vision and victory in a few crisp and vivid lines, Agard invites us to question why someone like Nanny has not ever appeared in the mainstream narrative. Because after all, it doesn't even take much to communicate her story, and yet this has never been done or taught in the national curriculum. So an interesting observation to make in the stanza is the use of coinages. And coinages, as we know, is the creation of a new word by compounding two existing words. So Nanny is described as a sea-far woman 
in line 27, and a fire woman in line 29. So see far is a compound adjective for visionary, or fire woman we can understand as this metaphorical characterization of her as a fiery, courageous and powerful leader figure. And so Nanny's the fearlessness then is what has led her people through the journey of realizing their mountain dream, their mountain dream through a hopeful stream and finally to the Freedom River. And so this imagery of the stream and the river, we can understand as being symbolic of the natural force, a tide that can never be erased, the, the Jamaican independence from British colonization. It's a wave that is inevitable and a tide that will carry on regardless of whatever obstacles there are. So as the poem moves into stanza seven and eight, the string of alternate anaphora of dem tell me but dem never tell me dem tell me but dem never tell me etc or variations of that we can see dem tell me but dem tell me but you can see here this anaphoric alternation hammers home a central tension that's embodied in the poem and that is that what we're told by those who yield narrative power is never really representative of the whole truth. They may tell us something, but it's never the full picture. So unless we interrogate these missing gaps by granting literary representation to marginalized characters, stories and achievements, and we know that they are marginalized because narratives are always composed within sociocultural structures that's reified by centuries of imperialist and colonial dominance, unless we give them the, their due literary and artistic spotlight, they are going to fade away from the future generation's consciousness. They're going to fade away from curricular narrative because educational indoctrination that's filtered through colonial lens is going to leave behind a doctored, limited and narrow awareness of history. So this is why in Agat's poem, the references to great European war generals and explorers like Lord Nelson and at the Battle of Waterloo, Columbus and the Discovery of America in 1492, they are counterposed by Shaka de Great Zulu and de Caribs and de Arawaks, because it's the poet's way of reworking this master slave power dialectic through a more balanced literary representation. So perhaps one could even interpret the vague references to Waterloo and 1492 being just these throwaway one word remarks referring to what are actually landmark historical events as these subtle anti-colonial gestures of resistance. It's by, by thinning out the representation of what has always been given the spotlight in the dominant historical narrative and instead amplifying the achievements of those who have long been swept under the narrative carpet through these secondary stances where the story of Toussaint, Nanny de Maroon and Mary Seacole are spelt out and fleshed out, we see that Agard here is trying to recalibrate this sort of power between the colonial masters and the colonized supposed slaves who have always had their voice and representation stripped from them unjustly. So in a similar vein to the juxtaposition of William the Conqueror late uh, William the Conqueror earlier in the 1066 and all that reference, or the Napoleon vis-a-vis -vis literature reference in stanza three to four, or Lord Nelson versus Shaka de Great Sulu in stanza seven. Stanza eight presents another, and this time female, set of overrepresented versus underrepresented heroes. And of course, the overrepresented is the European female, and the underrepresented is the Caribbean black female. And that's Florence Nightingale versus Mary Seacole, right? Florence Night Nightingale and she lamp and Mary Seacole. Now, both were English nurses who tended to the wounded during the Crimean War and had made lasting impacts on the healthcare systems of their societies. And yet, again, Nightingale is the one most people know about, her fame being so elevated that she's identifiable by just the moniker of the Lady and the Lamp, which is what the allusion to She Lamp here refers to. But how many in the Western world have actually learned of or even heard of Mary Seacole? whose achievements were actually equally incredible and deserving of celebration and documentation. Indeed, the injustice of Seacole's underrepresentation is borne out humorously by the wordplay and slant rhyme of Old King Cole was a merry old soul and Mary Seacole 
And this is interesting because most British children would have learned about the funny, but arguably comparatively inconsequential nursery rhyme of Old King Cole than they would have been aware of the national heroine that is Mary Seacole. But of course, in a curriculum that's designed by colonizers, perhaps it shouldn't be surprising that a white male coal, even a fictional one, would be deemed more important than a black female and real coal, right? Which is Mary Seacole. So with the penultimate stanza then, Agard reverses this power dynamic by retelling, in glowing terms, Seacole's humanitarianism and bravery. So the extent to which she gave hope to the wounded and the dying was so great that Agard metaphorizes Seacole as this healing star, a healing star among the wounded, and a yellow sunrise to the dying. So the suggestion here is that her presence was as comforting, constant, and reliable as the star that appears every night and the sun that rises every morning. Which again begs the obvious question as to why her achievements have never been celebrated or communicated in the national curriculum if it was so important and central to so many people's lives. So by the time we reach the final stanza, we hear the same accusation lodged at the beginning of the poem, echoed at the end, with dem tell me, dem tell me, what dem want to tell me. So except the speaker by this point is now enlightened by his introspective journey to say that he is no longer going to be a passive consumer of these Anglo-centric narratives. And signalled by the but conjunction, but in the penultimate line, he counterposes the symbolic violence of colonial narratives bandaging up me, I, with my own history, which we see here in the uh, second stanza earlier on here, these symbolically violent actions of bandaging up me, I, and blinding me to my own identity. By the end of the poem, he says, I won't take no more of that. Instead, I'm going to take back power as someone who will openly challenge and interrogate the kind of history he's been taught and told. So this proactive agency is signalled by the appearance, for the first time actually in this poem, of the singular first person subjective pronoun I in the final two lines, I, but now I checking out me own history, I carving out me identity. Notice that this the singular first person pronoun doesn't appear anywhere in the poem except towards the end, right? So by this point, once he experiences this epiphany, it is I, not Dem, who will determine what history speaks true to me, the speaker. So, of course, this is an incredibly empowering and powerful ending. And what's significant is that it also invites deep reflection on the nature of education, right? And of how we come to understand and accept the stories and narratives we've always been told. And to really interrogate and question whether we are told a specific narrative only because it's been filtered by those who have power, right? And whether that is always to certain extents limited or coloured by bias and ideology. Also thinking about whether or not there really is such a thing as historical truth or indeed as truth and whether history is only ever going to be this biased product that depends upon power structures which is always filtered and determined by those who have the dominant power and voice in any given culture and society. This poem isn't just to criticise the biased and anglocentric nature of uh, the sort of national curricula that you know one would receive in a country like England or even in America or that you know this idea that history is always written by the victors but it really just gets us thinking about the importance of challenging narratives of saying this is the narrative that I've been taught and told but what are some of the blind spots in this narrative? Is this narrative necessarily representative of all there is that I should know? And based on kind of my perspective and my unique identity, and this identity doesn't always just have to be race. It can be gender or sexual. It can even be based on values. It can be religious and political and ideological. But this specific idea that whatever narrative that you're told is necessarily the full truth is something that we must constantly interrogate and challenge. And one way of doing that, and the best way of doing that is perhaps to look inwards and to think about how we understand our own identity and to explore our own histories and our own backgrounds in search for a truth that speaks truest to ourselves.
And that's it for this analysis, guys. I hope you found my close reading of the poem insightful and helpful for your studies. And as always, if you enjoyed it, please do hit the thumbs up button below and subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification if you haven't already so that you don't miss out on any of my study videos down the line. I will upload them on a weekly basis, so make sure that you stay tuned. Also, of course, check out my power and conflict playlist in the description box below for my analysis of other poems in the anthology. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and direct message me with any questions you may have about your English Lit Studies at Hyperbolin. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!